In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So we're making our way through the collects of Advent, and let me just remind you of the terminology. A, a collect is spelled like collect, but it's pronounced collect, and a collect is a type of prayer. All collects are prayers, not all prayers are collects. It's one way to one way to think of them. They have a certain formula that I won't go into, but so we're going through these prayers or, or collects of Advent, and this particular prayer. We are asking the Lord to give us or help us be of such a mind that we will greet with joy the day of the Lord's coming. And the preparation involved has something to do with repentance in that prayer. And uh, repentance, of course, is connected to sin. Now, here's the thing, though. Repentance is about turning away from sin. Let's make no mistake about that, okay? I think it's more than that, though. I think that, and here's, here's the thinking. So in the first century, when Jesus came the first time, the Jews had been doing a lot of repenting. I mean, they, they and it, we're in a sacrificial system where the, the sacrifices that were offered in the temple, uh, many of them are about sin and repentance. It's not as if the Jewish people weren't repenting or trying to repent. Uh, they were trying to do the best they could, but... Jesus shows up, and many of them, maybe even most of them, didn't greet with joy the day of his first coming. So I ask myself, what makes me think that I'm going to greet with joy the day of the Lord's coming? Unless I'm really ready to be prepared for him to decide what that's going to look like. The part of the problem in the first century was that the Jews, to the extent that <clears throat> they were hoping, not all of them were hoping for a Messiah. Many of them were hoping for a Messiah. And to the extent that they were hoping for a Messiah, they usually had a sense in their head about what that might look like. And Jesus shows up and he doesn't look like it. All right? That's really a big part of the problem of Jesus' ministry is that he's basically saying, look, This is what you thought, but this is the way it really is. And I want to be a person who is ready for Jesus when he comes to say, oh, guess what? It isn't what you thought. Just like it wasn't the first time. Maybe repentance involves beliefs, not just sins. Maybe there are beliefs or ways of thinking about Jesus and about God that I need to be aware of so that I'm constantly keeping them in alignment with the Jesus that's actually revealed in Scripture. The Jesus that we find there. I think repentance perhaps has more to do. Uh, It's more about, it's more than just repenting of sins. It's repenting from beliefs. Let me give you one more piece of of sort of food for thought here. I've said this in, in teachings and perhaps in other sermons, The the first century Jewish historian Josephus, he wrote a story about himself when he was in the Roman army. He was told to go to Galilee to quell a rebellion. And the leader of the rebellion's name, by the way, was Jesus. Not the same Jesus. But what Josephus records saying to this leader was, repent and believe in me. And Josephus most certainly did not mean stop sinning and trust me for salvation. What he was saying is stop your rebelliousness, turn away from your way of being Jewish, what's going to get you killed, and trust me for a way out of this. And maybe when Jesus called us to repent, he, inclu- he did mean sins, but maybe he also meant You need to repent of who you think God is and trust me to reveal him to you. Trust me and the the God that you see in me. So, I think we need to be aware of false beliefs. And the, the lie of our age is, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. Well, I want to tell you why 
what you believe is important. And then I want to talk about how you go about sort of turning away from these false beliefs and clinging to the true God that's revealed in Jesus Christ. So, what you believe, what I believe matters, first of all, because I can choose what to believe. I mean, I really can. No one can force you to believe anything, and no one does force you. But when it comes to God, there are people believe all kinds of things about God. As a matter of fact, I submit to you that if you're in a conversation with someone and you use the word God and they use the word God, you can't be entirely sure that you're meaning the same thing. Because I know for a fact that there are are people who think that God is this cosmic meanie who is out to get you, or they have all these other ideas about God, and they're simply not true. When I talk to people about God and they say, well, I don't believe in God, I always ask them, tell me about the God that you don't believe in. I probably don't believe in him either. Okay? I can choose what to believe. Paul wrote in Romans 126, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. Well, what's the truth about God? Well, he tells us back in the first few verses of Romans, he tells us what the gospel is. He sums up the gospel. You want to know what the gospel of Jesus is in two sentences, you get it right here. The gospel regarding his son, this is not in your handout, you're just going to have to go look it up. <laughs> The gospel regarding his son, who as to earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now let me paint you the picture. What what Paul has just given you is a picture of God that looks like a V. Okay, God comes in the form of his son Jesus, who is a descendant of David. And at the apex of the V is the cross. Paul doesn't need to tell us that because we all know that's what he means when he says resurrection from the dead. So then, though he is made son of God in power by the Holy Spirit because of his resurrection from the dead. And here's the interesting thing. In the Greek, what you get, if you start here, you come down with the V, but by the time he's done, he's higher than where he started. Now, I don't know how that works. Can you be God and then you be like more than God? I don't know. But the point is that Jesus defines God. We need to let that Jesus be our definition of God. Now, my beliefs then shape my actions. That's why this stuff is important. When you go around in life on autopilot, the beliefs that you have about yourself, the beliefs that you have about God, are probably going to manifest themselves in some way in your behavior and in your actions. I was getting at this a little bit last week. The lies that you carry around, that we carry around in our heads about ourselves, like I'm no good, I'm not worthy, whatever, those lies go in our heads and then we start to act in ways that live out the lie. And the same is true with God. We carry all kinds of these ideas about God in our head, and some of them are lies. And they need to be corrected by the truth, by the truth that we get in Jesus Christ. And my beliefs shape my actions. Third, your beliefs are important because the false beliefs are all around us. And I'm just going to name a few. Your problems are someone else's fault. The world owes you happiness. Happiness is getting what you want. All beliefs are true. The answer is within you. I love that one. When people say the answer is within you, what they usually mean is, if it feels right, it is right. And the sexual scandals of Hollywood and Congress should show us by now that is a lie. An outright lie just because it feels right, actually probably makes it wrong. You really need to go check your compass. Beliefs are important because God is the source of capital T, truth. Paul, later in Romans, wrote, if, anyone, if everyone else is a liar, God is true. 
And in Hebrews, we're told that God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it's impossible for God to lie. Now, when the New Testament talks like this, what they mean is, is this. God promised through the prophets that he would send a savior to rescue Israel and to redeem them. And the prophets also said that when that happens, it was going to somehow include the rest of the world too. And then, of course, Jesus shows up. He rises from the dead. And those first Jews looked at that event and they said, oh, Ezekiel 37, the valley of dry bones. If Jesus is risen from the dead, that means forgiveness of sins has happened. That means that the kingdom of God is broken in. God followed through on his promise. God can be trusted. When God makes a promise, he doesn't renege. He's trustworthy. That's what the Bible means when they say that God is true. He cannot lie because he always follows through on his promise. And finally, the beliefs, my beliefs are important because your beliefs, whatever they are, are going to amount to the foundation upon which the rest of your life is built. And as Christians, as the hymn goes, as scripture says, the foundation needs to be Jesus. He is the one who defines God, not philosophy, not, certainly not you or me, he alone. And he is the interpretive lens, by the way, through which we read scripture. Which leads me to, so what do we do to turn away from false beliefs and embrace the truth? Repentance calls me to bind myself to that truth. And to do it, I bind myself, first of all, to learning God's truth. And that means I've got to read the Bible. And as soon as I say that, those words, I'm aware that we don't know how to read the Bible. I know that some of you are saying to yourself right now, oh, here he goes again. <clears throat> I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I, the Bible, I don't know how to make sense of it. And, you know, I'll just be honest with you. It isn't just going to, like, suddenly make sense. You're going to have to do some work. And this is why I suggest, you know, get a book like The Bible Tells Me So by Peter Enns. You know all those questions that people, all those objections that people have about the Bible? Peter Enns, who by the way has grown up in the evangelical tradition of the church and is now a professor somewhere out in, in the Midwest, he knows where he's coming from. He knows how Christians think about the Bible. And then he goes and says, now, look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this. This is what this means. This is why this is put together the way it is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You read a book like that, which by the way is very readable. It gives you some kind of framework for making sense out of the stuff that otherwise just confuses you and makes nonsense. It really, the Bible really does make sense. The problem is, is if you start treating it like a flat line, that's where you get into trouble. N.T. Wright says that the book, the Bible's more like a play. And so, if you're in a play, you're watching a play, and the characters in the play suddenly start to recite the lines from Act 1, well, that doesn't make any sense. But if you just plop in, in the middle of the play at Act 5, and you haven't seen Acts 1, 2, 3, and 4, you don't know what's going on. So you need to know Acts 1, 2, 3, and 4. But those things have, have happened. They're important to now, but that stuff is back there. We don't need to go back and relive it and redo it. This is why Christians have said for 2,000 years that we interpret Scripture through Jesus. He is the lens through which we read Scripture. And so when we come across stuff that doesn't make sense or confuses us, our first question needs to be, well, what did, how did Jesus' life reveal how to understand this? What, would Jesus, what did Jesus say or do that either makes this make sense or begins to raise questions about it. Because let's face it, there are some things that Jesus did that bring Scripture the way Jews understood it into question. That's why many of them were pointing their finger at him. I bind myself to learning God's truth. Secondly, I bind myself to living God's truth. 
Paul wrote in Ephesians, we will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. And let me just say, the church is not the institution. The church is, are the people right here and now. I mean, for you, in this moment, this is the church. The, we are not called to live the truth of God alone. As a matter of fact, we're commanded not to. We can't do it alone. We need the church. We need each other. And then finally, I bind myself to believing God's truth. Now, if you've been paying attention, you're saying, you said, no, wait a minute, Ben. You said that my beliefs shape my actions. And now you're saying my actions shape my belief. Yep, that's what I'm saying. Remember I said the first time on autopilot. When you're on autopilot, your beliefs shape your actions. And so if repentance involves turning away from false beliefs, well then we've got to be deliberate about it. And there is a principle that Christians have cited from at least the fourth century. In the Latin it goes like this, lex orande, lex credende. The law of prayer is the law of believing. The principle is that prayer shapes belief. Prayer is an action, right? It's something that we do and that shapes our belief. So we can extrapolate, I think safely, we can extrapolate from that and say, as we live out the truth, as we're learning the truth, as we're living it out as the church, through worship, through prayer, through ministry, then our beliefs are actually changed and reinforced and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. But it takes conscious, deliberate decision. This is how I'm going to live my life. And and the point of all this is, if I'm going to greet with joy the day of his coming, then I need to live as if Every day is the day. Every single day. This is the day. So I need to be about learning God's truth. And I need to be about living God's truth so that when I come face to face with Jesus, I will already believe his truth. Amen.